is important for the video. Uh, yes, Cub Scout Pack 55 has canceled their meeting, uh, but we're here, so <laughs> I don't know if what we're doing is more important than the Cub Scouts or not, but we can talk, we can talk about that on, on Piazza. Um, so the auto grader is, is working now for assignment zero. Uh, I see that people have been submitting things, and uh, if you're confused about stuff, please ask in Piazza or email us, but I think that the assignment zero stuff should work fine. And um, you know, it takes a few minutes uh, after you, it can take a few minutes after you submit. If you submit something that works well, it might not take very much time at all. But if you submit something that doesn't work, then it might take a little bit longer. So if you sit there waiting for things to come back for 30 seconds, especially for assignment zero, because we're not doing much to your kernel at all, then maybe you broke something. So, um, so I don't know if Kevin's here today or not, but um, Kevin saw me in the hallway yesterday and asked me, you know, what a, you know, what, like, what's a good timeline for, to, to think about because, you know, there's no deadlines and so how should we sort of allocate our time? So what I said is, you know, my suggestion is that you work backwards from the end of the class and I think the, I think their last meeting is like April 26th or something. It's a Monday and um, I'll decide and announce, you know, there will be a, a certain point in time at which all of the grades on the website for things like the scripts and the uh, implementations will all suddenly become final and you won't be able to change them. I'll figure out when that is, but at some point I'm going to hit that big red button, but it'll probably be around the time the class ends, maybe a little bit later. Um, so, so here's my suggestion. My suggestion is you allocate about a month for assignment three, maybe, maybe a little more, uh, but so that takes you through April, right? So I would say, you know, I would want to be starting assignment three around the end of um, the end of March, beginning of April. Um, I would also give yourself a month for assignment two. Assignment two is easier than assignment three, but when you start assignment three, you will have done assignment two, so you'll be stronger and um, maybe able to move a little bit faster, a little bit more used to what we do. So, um, so I would leave March for assignment two, and that basically, you know, gives you a sense of where you want to be. So, you know, it's early February. That's how I'm justifying it to myself. Um, but so I would, you know, try to have assignment zero and assignment one. I mean, assignment zero is trivial, right? But assignment one, I try to get that wrapped up by the end of the end of this month, right? Uh, and look, the the sooner the better. Clearly, you know, if you guys want to go, you know, I'll get assignment three hopefully up today, and uh, some of the automatic grading will start to work for the other assignments pretty soon. So, at some point, you know, maybe next week, you guys, if you had stuff to submit, you could submit all these assignments, just be done, right? And then you could just come to class and enjoy life and work on your other assignments for other courses, um, things like that. But, but again, this is really up to you, but this is my suggestion, right? I think this is a reasonable uh, amount of time, right? And you know, no matter where you are, the TAs will be helping you during office hours, and I hope people will have more people coming to office hours and helping each other, but, uh, but this is kind of the timeline I would, I would be on. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that if you get, I mean, if you get ahead, you get ahead, great, right? You can spend the rest of the semester relaxing or uh, scoring, you know, karma points by helping, helping each other, right? Helping other students that hadn't got to where you, you got. If you get too far behind, then, you know, suddenly you're going to be coming into office hours in like April with questions about assignment zero, and the TAs will probably be like, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, there, there's, a, there's a disincentive to getting too far behind, right? So, uh, because other people have moved on and we'll be thinking about different things, and, and you'll still be like, how do I, how do I make a patch, right? Um, so, but anyway, there's good, it's good instructions about this. So, uh, any questions about the <laughs> about any questions about uh, timeline about the assignments? Again, as as we get more things to work, I mean, again, now all the code reading grading should work, the script grading works. Uh, I just need to sort of like reproduce some of the grading for the other assignments, but but I have I have scripts to do that. I think again, make some modifications. Backwards, backwards no, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> when planning your semester, I would work backwards, right? I mean, if you do assignment three, in theory, you should be able to submit that for credit for assignment two, assignment one, and assignment zero, right? Um, so that's, you're welcome to try that, but um, I, would, I would probably work forwards through the assignments, but I would work backwards when, when developing a plan, right? Because you, know, you want to be at the end of assignment three by the time that you know, I, I push the big button that, that seals and finalizes all the grades. Yeah, about the Talked about uh, like design documents at the beginning of the semester. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at assignment two and assignment three, uh, both those assignments include a fairly significant component that's a design document. Right? I haven't really talked about that because I don't think anybody's there yet. But, um, and, and those will be graded by the TAs. 
There will probably be, similar to the code reading questions, two-shot grading. It's a big chunk of the assignment. It's a two-page PDF outlining how you're going to complete the assignment. Right? I wish they could be longer, but there's a lot of you and there's a small number of us. Uh, but the idea is we want you to do some design before you get started. Right? Uh, I can't, I'm not going to impose any sort of continuity on those design documents. I mean, if you want to write them after you wrote the code, I guess that's OK. But, um, but you will need to submit them, and they will, be, you know, they will be graded at least once, if not twice. Right? But they're big chunks. And, and those are described on the Assignment 2 handout. The Assignment 3 handout also has a description of our expectations for the design documents. Any other questions? Before we get going, yeah. Uh, is this text I think it is. <laughs> try, try it and see. So what was happening before is that blank. An I think what was happening was that blank answers were overwriting completed answers, and that I think is fixed. So if you fill out a couple and your partner fills out a couple and you both save them, the last person won't overwrite. Won't overwrite blank. Blah, blah. The last person's blank answers for the things they didn't answer won't overwrite the first person's completed answers. Right. <laughs> If you guys are having problems with this, please let me know, right? Like, I, I couldn't, re well, I could reproduce pieces of that, but it was very difficult to figure out exactly, like, the order of operations that you guys have. Nick, did you have a? No, I'm sorry, I didn't start off. OK, OK, yeah, yeah. No, no, if, if, you, if you guys can, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I tried to look at that, and I think I understand what was happening, but, but if I'm wrong, let me know. Right? And I'm sorry about answers that vanished into cyberspace. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, oh, no, I mean, it works for me, too, right? <laughs> but the problem is that there are people it didn't work for, and clearly that's a problem, but I just, I, like, I can't reproduce it locally, so I can't figure out exactly, exactly what happened, right? Any other questions? All right, so we're going to skip the review today because I'm a little, a little running a little bit behind. But do people have any questions about material that we covered on Wednesday? We started to talk uh, about threads, uh, a little bit about illusion of concurrency, um, this was from there, so you know, this was kind of, this is our mental model of threads, right? So a single process is like a, you know, a, a kitchen in a nice restaurant, threads are the cooks, and I, I actually like this a lot. You know, the more I thought about this, the more I thought, this is a nice metaphor, right? There aren't too many things that are wrong about this, right? Uh, there are some, but, you know, as in many metaphors, you take it too far, things start to fall down, but, um, but this is a pretty good mental model to think about the differences between threads and processes, and thinks about cases when you would want multiple threads as opposed to multiple multiple processes. All right. So this is a little bit of review, because we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the semester, right? So you know, we talked about cases where certain types of applications can naturally make use of multi-threading, right? And I want to be careful here. So throughout, in this deck of slides, when I'm talking about multiple threads, I'm always talking about multiple threads in the same process, right? Clearly, your system and most modern operating systems have multiple threads across the entire system, right? But in this case, when we talk about multi-thread applications, we're talking about a single application with multiple threads, right? And we'll talk about ways that the kernel supports multi-threading, right? And I distinguish that from multi-processing. So all modern kernels, including the guys, you guys, the one you guys are writing this semester, support multi-processing, right? Meaning multiple processes. Your kernel this semester doesn't have any support for for real multi-threading, right, at the kernel level, so multiple threads per process, you could add that if you want to, but it's certainly not required, right? Um, so different, you know, different types of applications, you know, and again, we've talked about this, have, have sort of natural ways that they can use multiple threads, right? So web servers uh, can usually separate requests among threads, right? Um, sometimes something else we do, so, so that, that would be an example of what I would think of as kind of a vertical partition of my software stack, right? I have a thread, a request comes in at the top, and the thread, that one thread does all the work required to essentially collect all of the files necessary to serve the request, to do any sort of dynamic uh, generation of content that's, you know, a mainstay of, of modern web design, and then at the end writes the resulting HTML response out over whatever socket is appropriate, right? So that, again, is kind of this example of this vertical partitioning, right? You also have applications that do more of a horizontal partitioning where they'll have a single stage of the application that's served by multiple, multiple threads, right? And, and sometimes we call, we call that a thread pool, right? So if I have a stage in my application, like in a reading or writing from disk, I might allocate 10 threads to do that. 
and they take requests, they go do it and complete the request. And so there's a little stage of the application now that, that I exploit some parallelism in by, by allocating the thread pool. And a lot of you know, Java, if you guys have programmed in Java or Python or you know, even C probably has libraries to do this, thread pools are a pretty common abstraction, right? I have some work that needs to be done that work has latency associated with it, and I use threads to mask that latency and allow me to exploit uh, some inherent parallelism in the machine, right? So web browsers, you know, might have separate threads for each tab. Frequently, when you load a single web page, your browser will use several different threads to fetch different parts of the web page, right? When you load a single web page, not everything's in there. There's images that need to be loaded. Maybe there's some JavaScript that needs to be run or whatever. So there's actually some, some multi-threading going on even within a single request, right, to improve performance. Um, and then frequently, you know, scientific applications we think of have these divide and conquer approaches that rely on what are thought of as, you know, embarrassingly parallelizable data sets, right? So frequently when I'm doing large scale data processing, I can actually, this is the foundation of things like MapReduce, right? I can actually break these things down into much smaller pieces, process them separately, right, without sharing a lot of state, and then merge the result together, right? So this is an example of, of different, different applications that might want to use threads. Did I hear a murmur over here? Okay. Just hearing things today, and and we again. This is, this is all, I guess this is all a little bit of review, right? So we talked a little bit on Wednesday. So why why not just write you know why not write my web server in such a way that when I start it, it forks off a bunch of copies of itself and uses separate processes to process every request that comes in? Why wouldn't I do this? Or why doesn't Firefox when you start it up launch all sorts of different processes like? You know, for, for every tab or something like that, right? Yeah, Brian. Um, communication is more difficult. Yeah, so I mean, the, the big problem here is that communication is hard, right? And the communication is hard because the kernel is defending processes from <laughs> interfering with each other, right? It's, that's one of the jobs of the kernel, remember, is to prevent processes from molestation, right? So, um, and to some degree, communication and molestation look quite similar. Uh, depending on you know whose perspective you look at it from, right? So the defending processes from interfering with each other ends up making it more difficult for them to communicate. It forces more structure into the communication, right? So I, I have these IPC mechanisms, but they're all set up so that they're you know very carefully to produce some semantics that allow them to be used safely, right? Whereas in my own process. You know, inside my address space, I've got some memory that's allocated to me. I got six threads going on. They can do whatever they want, right? They, the, I, any type of messaging paradigm or communication I want to, and, and in particular, communication using shared memory, right, is is completely fine and okay, right? And the the operating system's not going to help me do it safely, but the operating system also isn't going to stop me from doing it, right? And then the other thing with processes is that as I start to fork multiple processes, the state associated with those processes doesn't always scale very well, right? And this is a little, uh, again, a little bit of a mini review. So as opposed to a thread, which has pieces of state that are private to it, what is the state associated with the process that I would be able to not have to duplicate if I used multiple threads to, to handle my parallelizable job instead of multiple processes? What's, what's one? piece of per process state that I would be worried about having to duplicate a lot. Let's see. Tim? Remember, threads have a registers and they have a stack, right? And then the process has what? Yeah, so particularly the memory, right, is, is the big worry here, right? As I start to fork multiple processes, those forked processes are not supposed to share memory, right? And the operating system plays some tricks to allow them to share memory safely as long as they're only reading from it. But to some degree, co copying a process involves a fair, you know, reproducing a fair amount of state, right? It turns out, yeah. Cool. Distinguish between the stack and the heap. Um, Table that, let's table that question for a month, and, and we, we will talk about it, right? So uh, the stack and the heap have different semantics in terms of how the operating system allocates memory to those areas, right? To some degree, though, the stack and the heap are, are abstractions that are you know, set up by programs for their own use, right? There's no reason, for example, that threads, well, could they do that? They probably could. Like, threads could probably have stacks in the heap if they wanted to, right? It's just typically not how it's done. All right, so I've got, and again, I have this per process state that I don't want to scale, right? Um, 
So, so we, 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 and I, I used this before, this, this assertion to try to convince you that um, abstraction uh, you know, didn't require privilege, right? But we're going to come back to it now. So when I start to think about how to implement threads, and this is an interesting design exercise, right? I want you guys to think about this as, as you know, software engineers and designers. Where, where should I implement threads, right? So as I, as I claimed before, threads can be implemented in user space using unprivileged libraries, right? And for a period of time, Linux did not support multiple threads in user processes. So Linux only saw one thread per process. Applications that wanted to use multiple threads within the same process had to use libraries like pthreads that allowed them to do this, right? But from the kernel's perspective, there was only one thread, right? So these user space libraries work by implementing switching between threads in a user space library. But to the kernel, again, all the kernel sees is one thread. So here's a process that has multiple threads. Those threads are implemented in some user space library. And all the kernel sees here is one thread, right? So the kernel sees this one thread, and that thread seems to be very busy doing all sorts of things all over the place. But the kernel has no idea, necessarily, that there's a, um, there's a pthreads library that's actually doing this, right? So here's the, and, and, we, in the in, and if you look in the literature, this is usually referred to as the m to 1 threading mop, right? So m user space threads, some number larger than 1. But to the operating system kernel, I only see one thread, right? So threads can also be implemented by the kernel. Right, so the, you know, now Linux has you know, the clone system call, which allows me to create a thread. Right? And this is, and if I have a direct mapping between my user space threads, so the multiple threads that are in a single process, where's my little bit? I don't know where that's pointing. Um, and the threads that are visible to the kernel, and this is called the, the one-to-one -one threading. Right? So there are, so again, let's, let's go back to this. Right? So implementing threads in user space. Right? So, so how? How is this possible? Let's think about what I need to do, right? So essentially, implementing multiple threads means finding a way to switch between one thread and another. We talked before about the process of doing this when I enter the kernel, right? So when I trap into the kernel, one of the first things that happens is I save all this context, and we refer to this as a context switch. In that particular case, I'm switching from some user context, or maybe, I don't know, maybe another kernel context if I'm processing a hardware interrupt, and I'm switching into the kernel. So I'm saving all the state. So how do I do this in user space? It's not a, not a trick question. Can you simulate the same kind of context within your user space? Yeah, I mean, basically the answer is the same way, right? I need to have some code that saves all the registers. You know, when I'm going to stop a thread from running, I need to make sure that when I start it again, things look identical, right? Or at least the registers and its stack look identical. And so I have a similar block of code to the one I showed you that's executed by your kernel, but that block of code is executed in user space, right? So it saves all the registers, repoints the stack pointer, and then runs some code to figure out what thread to run, and, and save, is saving all these thread states various places so it knows, OK, I'm going to run this thread that have, hasn't run for a while. I need to know where all the information associated with that thread is, right? And because I don't have to switch between processes, there's no kernel privilege required, right? Remember, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm reallocating resources that have been already allocated to my process, right? So the nice thing here is, you know, because kernel privilege is used to isolate processes from each other, there's no need to get the kernel involved. And again, in the you know, m to 1 threading model, the kernel doesn't even know that there are multiple threads. Right? All the kernel sees is one thread. Right? Um, so the, thing, the things we have to think about are, how do I save and restore context? Right? So this is pretty fundamental. Right? How can I stop a thread and start it again? Right? And the C library actually has, how many people have ever used set jump or long jump before? Oh, OK, cool. This, this next example will blow your minds a little bit. This is fun stuff, right? So it turns out the C library actually has an implementation of this, right, which is called set jump long jump, right? Um, set jump saves the state. I think this is how it works. And long jump returns to the point where the state was, st state was saved, right? So let's come back to the preempt other threads. Uh, let me show you this piece of code, right? So this is, this is pretty fun. Um, so I've got a loop here, right? So this is a jump buffer. Right? What do you think is in the jump buffer? What you saved. Yeah, this, this holds the saved context. 
right? This is going to be passed back and forth between setch up and log jump, right? So here's my, um, here's my loop, right? This is pretty, pretty basic C code, right? I'm going to loop over this 10 times. I'm going to print the value of i, right? Now, when I get to i equals 5, what I'm going to do is save my state. And then if I'm coming back in here, so if this equals 0, if I'm saving state for the first time, then I save this. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, print out this restored CPU state. And let me show you what happens here so I can remind myself how this works. OK, yeah, here we go. So what, 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 so what happens, ah, OK, here we go. So what happens here is the following. I start at the top of the loop, right? When i equals 5, I break out of the loop, right? So at this point, I'm down here, OK? Then setjump has saved the state of my thread at that moment, right? So set, I think setjump, well, if I remember correctly, setjump is like fork. So if I call it for the first time, it returns 0 to indicate that the, thread, that the state was saved. So the first time here, I save the state and I break out of the loop, right? Now I'm done here, right? I have this you know, variable restore that I'm using just to decide whether or not I'm going to jump back into the loop. And now when I run long jump, I'm right back here, right? So this is pretty cool, right? So I come through here, I go through the loop, I print out the first five values of i. Now I save state. I should have had a printf down here, right? I save the CPU state, I break out a loop, I'm here. And now I call long jump, and all of a sudden I'm back in the middle of the loop with i equal to 5, right? So it's like I was whisked away from my loop, right? It turns out here that I changed the control flow when that happened. But when I call long jump, I'm just right back to where I was exactly at the moment that call, call was made, right? Does this make sense to people? This is a little. Yeah, it is, it is similar to a continuation. Oh, man, all these wonderful PL things that I don't want to talk about. Um, yeah, so, so essentially, I mean, you can think about this as a continuation, but what's, what's happening here is, is this is, again, saving all the state necessary to allow me to return to that exact moment in time, right? So I'm just showing you this as proof that this is possible, right? I don't, I've never seen like real um, legitimate, well, I shouldn't say legitimate, I mean, I don't read a lot of C code for fun, right? I would be surprised if there were like super legitimate uses for setch up and log up other than like obfuscated code competitions, right? Um, but, but this is still pretty cool. It shows you what you can do. Yeah? Uh, the triggering of these functions are initiated by the value of i. It's controlled by the value of i. What is i exactly? And you're running the loop, so. So, so, what it, so you guys are, are C programmers. Now you need to understand this stuff. Where is the value of i stored? In <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is an int, right? But where is the value of i? If I was looking at my program and I said, where is, like, i is an int, right? But, you know, it's a, let's say it's a four-byte four, four byte machine, so there's 32 bits somewhere that are i. Where are they? They're on this thread stack. So, oh, and, and you know, it turns out that the compiler also might have, had a, have shoved them into a register somewhere, right? But in, but in general, these local variables are allocated and deallocated from my stack, right? And if you guys, um, maybe this is something we'll do next week in recitations, but if you guys start looking at some of the disassembly of your OS161 binaries, you can see uh, where space is being allocated for stacks, right? And this is a good thing. If you guys haven't walked through this before, to see, you know, when I enter this loop, the C compiler will output instructions necessary to preserve enough space on my stack to hold all of the variables that are there. Right? All right. And it, and it, turn, and it turns out there's one, there's one very interesting uh, trick here, right? When I call long jump, right, I think this value is like what, lo what should return from set jump. What actually happens here is I jump back here, but set jump now returns 1. So that's why I end up, when I call long jump, I end up down the other part of this, this branch, right? So there's a small change that's been made to my state. The call to set jump returned a different value. Other than that, all of the rest of my state is preserved. Right? And, and again, this is just like something, I don't know. If, <laughs> if you have friends that are impressed by this, then you have some, you have some good friends. Um, all right, let's see here. So let's, yeah. The, uh, the other issue, yeah, one more. Pass one to a long jump? Could you, could it, like, could you pass different values in and then have that 
I think, I think you could, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to jump back into a case statement or something like that, again, like, do not use this function as a normal C programmer, right? Like, C control flow is, hard, is, is, is weird enough, right? This is just terrible, right? So if you start using this on a regular basis, then I would argue that, that maybe you need to rethink how you're writing, writing computer code. Um, Vibers? Fibers. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but here's the other, so here's the other question with user space threading libraries, right? So now I've, I think maybe I've convinced you that I can save and restore threads, thread state in user space. But how do I preempt other threads? So how does the kernel preempt other threads? Let's go back to kernel level threading, right? How does the kernel keep threads from running forever? How does the kernel make sure that it has a chance to stop a thread and do something else? Yeah, it uses this timer interrupt that's generated periodically by hardware. And every time the timer fires, the kernel is, is going to run, right? And the kernel protects the operation of the timer and the code that the timer runs, the interrupt handler, from access by user programs, right? So if, I've, if my kernel is correctly written, every time the timer fires, the t the, if the kernel is correctly written, two things are true. The timer will always fire when the kernel wants it to fire, and the kernel always can control when the timer does fire, right? So, how do I do this in user space? Well, first of all, let me ask you this question. Can, can a user space program ensure that some piece of code always runs? Does it have any mechanism for doing this? Remember, let's say I'm going to preempt another thread. So something's going to happen, and then I'm going to Jump, it's just going to be very much like, like what the kernel does. I'm going to jump to a memory address, and I'm going to start executing some code that's going to return control to the user space thread scheduler. So, so threads, in an address <laughs> threads in a process share what? Memory. memory. Where is this code going to live? Did you say the same thing you just said? Oh, memory. memory. This code's going to be in my process memory somewhere. Any thread can overwrite it, right? So no, basically the answer is that there is no way to do preemptive multitasking in a user space library, right? I should, guess, guess I shouldn't say no. There's no one that I, I don't think this is normally done, right? What has to happen is that the threads in the user space library have to cooperate and agree, for example, not to mess with each other, right? Because if a thread wanted to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I am now the most important thread in Apache, no other thread should ever run, it could just disable the signal or overwrite the signal handle or whatever, right? But the actual way this is done is that we use signals delivered by the operating system. We talked about signals as a form of IPC. And uh, many of you guys probably maybe have used signals or didn't know you were using signals, but the process can ask that the kernel deliver a periodic signal to it every, you know, so many ticks. It's very much like a timer, right? It's a similar sort of thing. The signal is a software construct, but when the signal is delivered, the user space program will jump into a signal handler and handle that signal. And normally this is how these user space libraries do, um, do scheduling, right? Sam? No. Yeah, so, so, so the question is, could I, um, you know, in the middle of, well, I actually didn't want to go forward, right? So in the middle of this setchum call, could I be preempted by the kernel? Yeah. And what would happen when I started running again? I would just finish the call, right? What, whatever series of instructions. So, so imagine, you know, you saw that whole big, big block of code that saves all the registers in the kernel. If I was running that in user space and I was interrupted, I would just start again, right? And, and hope, you know, hopefully, if, if no one else has run, then the state of my memory is the same. Right? So, so yeah, I would, just, I would just be restarted. Right? So let's, let's think as designers, and we'll think about like, comparing different ways of implementing threads. Right? So I've got user space libraries that allow me to implement threads in user space. I've got kernel support for multi-threading uh, in, in more modern systems. So what do you guys think would be some of the, some of the advantages of user space threading. So implementing threads in user space, not telling the kernel about it. The kernel thinks there's one thread in my process, just, just a very busy bee and never seems to block. What's the other, um, actually that's a good question, right? What's the other thing I need to be careful about if I'm running a user space threading library? 
So I've got, again, I've got one kernel thread. The kernel doesn't know that, I'm, that I've got multiple threads and I actually have a couple of things that are going on in user space. But what do my user space threads have to be really careful not to do? What could they do that would, would cause the, this, whole, this whole delicate arrangement to really fall down pretty badly? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, well yeah. The, the, certainly, synchronization can cause problems with, with uh, correctness, right? We'll talk a lot more about that next week. But what could they do that would cause this whole thing to fail? Mm, that's not, not what I'm thinking of. That would be <laughs> weird. Tim, do you have a Yes. If I do blocking I.O. So if I do a read call, right? Let's say I'm running my web server. I've got 30 threads in the user space, but the kernel doesn't know that, right? The kernel just sees me. If I do a blocking read while I'm running, the whole process and every other thread will block until my read call finishes, right? There may be 29 other threads that could run and do useful work, right? But I have blocked the entire process. Right? So user space th using user space threading libraries typically means one of two things. I, a, I either have to do explicit asynchronous I.O. Right? So I have to, what asynchronous I.O. means is that when I ask the kernel to do a read, I don't wait for it to complete. I go back to executing instructions, and then I have to have some mechanism for finding out later that the read is done. Right? So I can either do that explicitly, or my threading library may provide calls that do it for me. Right? So they may provide a version of read right, that blocks my thread in the threading library, causes the threading library to do the request on my behalf, and then I get restarted. So this ends up being very, very similar to what happens in the kernel when I do reads. But right, if I block one thread in my multi-threaded user process, the whole process will block. And it doesn't matter whether or not there are other threads that can be run, because the kernel doesn't know. Right? The kernel has no way of knowing that, hey, if I just let this, if I just you know, let it keep running, there's other things it could do. Right? So I have to be very careful about, about whoa, uh, synchronous I.O. All right. All right, so pros to doing threading in user space. There are some pros, right? What, what are they? So what's, so, so ima imagine, I mean, what, what does the kernel, so I, I keep saying the kernel doesn't know that there are threads, right? But because the kernel doesn't know that there are threads, what's not happening? Yeah, Jeff. Uh, OK, I don't have to request the kernel create a new thread. That's true. What else don't I have to request the kernel do? Simon. Well, the kernel's probably, usually the kernel's not going to help me protect threads against each other anyway. That's my problem as a program, right? What else do I not need to do? What is, your, is your name Tao? Yeah. yeah. You guys are on the right track here. Kernel requests. What do, what do I not have to have the kernel do for me? Well, the, all the memory is going to be shared by these threads anyway. Can we go to Tao over here? He doesn't know. Yeah, Brian. Okay, so okay, that's a great point, right? So, so I have more control over scheduling, right? Potentially, um, because I know more about the threads that are that are running, and I might I might have like a specific scheduling policy I want to implement. That's a good that's a good one. I don't think that's even up on the slide, but that's a good point. What else though? What can I avoid when I switch between threads? What do I not have to do? Well, I have to save the state, right? But what else do I not have to do? I don't have to talk to the kernel, right? Kernel multi-threading means that every time, the, in the kernel multi-threading, every time I switch between threads, the kernel runs, right? In user multi-threading, I'm switching between threads in my library, and the kernel never gets involved, right? And it turns out that when I enter and leave the kernel, there's actually a fair amount more going on than just saving context. That's part of it, right? But it turns out that user space threading libraries can usually switch between threads much, much more efficiently than the kernel can because I don't have to get in and out of the kernel. I can just you know, let my threading library do it, right? Um, OK, what about cons? What's, what's, a, what's a problem here? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. So how many threads does the kernel think the process has? Let's say I have a four core machine. Will this process ever run on multiple cores at the same time? 
No, because the kernel doesn't know there are more than one thread, right? The kernel would have to schedule it across multiple cores. The kernel has no clue, right? So, you know, until I had multi-core machines, maybe this wasn't a big deal, but it is kind of a big deal now, right? Because I've got 16 cores in the machine and I want to allocate three or four of them to my process. The kernel has no clue what's going on. Then the kernel just thinks it's a single-threaded application. It's just going to have it on one core, right? Uh, what else? What's another? Uh, that, that's a that's a good. Well, maybe that's enough. So I think we've got most of these, right? So the threading operations are a lot faster. Thread state is smaller, right? Because there's state that the kernel keeps that the, the the applications don't have to. Can't use multiple cores, and there there may be scheduling problems with um, this with the kernel looking at this because I'm hiding information from the kernel, right? It's possible that the kernel could do a better job of scheduling me if it knew about the fact that I contain more than one thread and maybe if it knew a little bit more about what those threads are doing, which it does once I start to expose information about those threads to the kernel, right? And again, a single thread can block the entire process if it's... <laughs> so, so this is really, you know, the, the multiple threads in user space is really a highly collaborative, right, or cooperative approach. There are, there are old systems that actually had versions of what are, what's called cooperative uh, multitasking or co cooperative multiprocessing, which meant that, you know, instead of, remember the kernel, this dictatorial thing, right? When your time quantum is up, it's going to run. Not all kernels were built that way. Some kernels would wait for the process to do a system call or to, uh, for a hardware interrupt to happen or for the process to say, I'm done now. Um, you can run somebody else. Right? So there were, there were systems that actually required that the processes yield control. And I remember a friend of mine was, you know, had an early version of Mac. This was maybe like Mac 8 or something. It was, it was way before, before the more modern versions of Mac OS. But when he would burn DVDs, the whole machine would lock up for like 20 minutes. Nothing would happen. Right? It would just sit there burning the DVD, and then it would stop. Right? and everything else would start to paint. But it was literally like, because that app, for whatever reason, didn't ever yield control, it just sat there, right? So this is cooperative multitasking going around, and this is why we don't do it. But user space threading libraries have to rely on the threads to cooperate and not to mess with each other, because there's no way to, to do it any other way. Yeah? So what the user space process block embeds in um, corporate the kernel, and is that why a single thread blocking in the user space like thread library would block up? Yeah, yeah. So, so if I if I like if I use a pthread library and then I make like a, a, a call to read and I don't do this, probably like a pthread read or something, right? But if I just call bare read, then it'll enter the kernel, and the kernel will put me to sleep until that read completes. We're going to talk about this more, you know, today, Monday. Mukta, you have a question? Okay. All right. Okay. So now, what about the one-to-one -one kernel threading model? Right. I tell the kernel about every thread. I don't hide any information from it. So what about pros and cons here? So really it's like it's to some degree the inverse of what we just did, right? Give me a give me a pro. What would be better about this world? That's somebody from the back of the room. Someone who hasn't raised their hand. Pro of this approach. All the way in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, I can use multiple cores. That's one. Um, what else? What's another pro of this approach? You. No, behind you. What's her name? Yeah. Do you know? Okay. No. Any other? What about a con? A con. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, so there's, there's this context switch overhead. And, and you're right, actually, that's true. Because the state is bigger in the kernel, it's more difficult to support many, many, many threads in the kernel. Right? So, so in general, the pros here involve the fact that more visibility means the kernel can do better scheduling. I can schedule across multiple cores in a multi-core machine. I can uh, you know, put you to sleep properly when you block and wake you up. And you, know, you don't have to do you know, the asynchronous I own user space. But in general, the context switch overhead is, is, is one of the big cons here. Right. Um, there are there are actually now what are called M2N threading library implementations, right? That use like some fearsome mixture of these two approaches, right? So they use multiple kernel threads, 
but they also do some multi-threading in user space, right? And that, to me, seems very interesting and probably something that would be difficult to get right. But, but you can do that if you want to, right? So there are threading libraries that will allow you to create lots of threads and will tell the kernel about some number of them, right? Maybe enough to exploit the natural parallelism in my machine, right? So if I'm on a 16-core machine, I might tell the kernel I have 16 threads, but I might allow you to create like 64 threads, right? And I might do some switching in user space, some switching in the kernel, right? So I can merge these two approaches, right? So at, th at this point, yeah, Guru. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so in general, in, or in order to do any of this user space threading, right, what's really important is that I have a s support for asynchronous I.O. at the kernel level, right? So the kernel has to provide me a, a and, and this is particularly important with file I.O., right? Why, why would it be so important with file I.O.? What's the problem with, file, with files and, and block devices and other things that, you know, so, so, so again, like, I, I, I would argue, you know, things like fork and exec are okay. I mean, first of all, exec, if I call exec, then who cares what happens to the other threads in the process, right? Because the process is going away, right? Um, but, you know, and, and fork, I guess fork is also a little bit weird, right? Why, why, why is it important? With file I.O. So, so Guru was saying if I just had read and read always blocked, then it would be a problem for an application that was trying to support multi or a library that was trying to support multiple threads in user space, right? The problem is, but the, the problem is that the thread is going to, the whole process will sleep until the read completes. How long is that going to be? Bart. I'm reading from a file, right? And, the, and, and I could, again, I could just, blo I could just block the entire, the entire multi-threaded user process until that read complete. Why wouldn't I want to do that? What's true about the CPU with respect to other components on the system? It's way faster. That I.O. is going to take forever to complete, right? And the probability is that the, if I have a multi-threaded application, there are likely other threads that could be running and doing useful work while that I.O. is completing. So what I need to do is the kernel has to provide an asynchronous um, disk I.O. interface, right? Or a synchronous, some asynchronous system calls, right? And, and we talked about that before. So what this means is that when I call read, for example, I tell the kernel, hey, I want to do a read, but I don't block, right? The call, I enter the kernel, I pass in the arguments, the kernel copies the arguments out, but as soon as it's done with that, I get to run again, right? Now, of course, the problem is that with the synchronous read, what's nice is that I give the kernel I tell the kernel, I want data from a file to go here. And the way I know that the data is there is that the call completes, right? The next instruction I, I run, if the read completed successfully, I have to check the, the return value. But assuming it completed successfully, the next instruction I run, I can, I can be sure that the data I've requested is in that buffer that I gave the kernel, right? With an asynchronous call, I don't know when the read's going to complete, right? I get to run again. But now I have this communication mechanism where the kernel needs a way of telling me or I need a way of asking, is the read done, right? And I think what these threading libraries would do is they would, they would make an asynchronous call, right? And then periodically they would be checking. So my thread would make a read through the library. The library would make an asynchronous read call and would put my thread to sleep in user space, right? It would periodically be checking, or the kernel would be telling me, is that read done? When that read is done, it would allow me to run again. And in fact, it's a nice segue because the next thing we're going to talk about before we finish today, I hope. Oh, maybe not. Uh, let me just introduce these states, because we're, uh, Guru got us to a good segue, right? So when we talk about threads, right? And this actually can be true both in user space and in the kernel, but we're going to be talking mainly about the kernel's view of threads, right? Um, and sometimes we talk about, so if I have one thread per process, sometimes I'll slip up or you'll slip up, and you'll talk about the process as being in one of these states, right? But in, re in reality, threads are in one of these states, not a process, right? If a process has multiple threads, its threads can each be in different states, right? So running, what do you think the running state is? Let's do this fairly quickly. Tom, if a thread is running, what does it mean? Yeah, these are not, not trick questions. It's executing instructions, right? It's scheduled on a CPU core, it's running, it's executing instructions, right? What about ready? What would a thread being ready mean? 
Matthew? It's r okay, so what is it not? It's not running. Can it run? Yes, if there is somebody else. Yes. So this thread is not executing instructions, but whenever I want to, I could start it up on a, on a core. Right? This is a thread that can run. It's ready to run. Right? It just happens not to be running. What about this? Waiting, blocked, or sleeping? Synonyms for something pretty much the same thing. Bethany. Yeah, yeah. So this thread is not running. It is, these are mutually exclusive states. It is not ready. It is waiting for something to happen. It may be sleeping. It, it, we call it sleeping. We say it's sleeping until that thing happens, right? And blocked is a similar way of saying it can't go any farther forward until something else happens, right? So this means it's not executing instructions and it's not able to be restarted, right? So it's not running. It's not ready, right? Um, and we'll finish the thread straight turn distance on Monday. Have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy the snow, uh, and I'll see you guys on Monday.